Were they there? They were there. Okay, whether or not they were helpful. They're helpful to some. Okay, so I am going to request super nicely that the cell phones are on silent and put away. I have noticed they have become a big distraction for people. Um, partly myself, but also I think it's probably a little harder to learn while you're playing games or texting. So I'm just asking very nicely to just put them down, upside down, okay? Just for a little while. You can survive it. You can do it. And I'll tell you, I do know how hard it is. Teachers are the worst. You put a group of teachers in a room and make us listen to lectures. We fall asleep or we play on our phones. We are also guilty. So they should probably tell that to us at the beginning of our faculty meetings. Okay, so I, I, I understand. Okay, so we are starting today. Um, oh, one more minute before I forget. I know the weather's going to be nice this week. Please remember in lab, no closed, no open-toed shoes, okay? So Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever lab you're in, make sure you're wearing the appropriate shoe attire, even if the weather's nice. Maybe you'll have to go back and change your shoes when, for lab. Okay, just remembering that. Okay, so we finished on Friday talking about all the functions of the respiratory system, that long list of eight things that took a while. Not respiratory, sorry. Did I say respiratory? Digestive system. So now we're going to continue on and talking about different ways that the respiratory is... Sorry. It's on my mind because you have a quiz. Different ways the respiratory... Gosh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm stuck. Different ways the digestive system is regulated. So it is, if we look, two main methods of regulation, both so the nervous system is involved and we have chemicals that are involved. And so we are going to learn a lot about some of our chemicals um, this chapter, gastrin and secretin, are two important ones. We'll get there. Okay, so the nervous system regulation back over here is through what's called the enteric nervous system. So if you remember the nerves of the meat, near the neck we have two sets of nerves. We have the phrenic nerves, and then we also have the vagus nerves. Remember, we have one on either side of both. Well, the vagus nerve goes down past the diaphragm and innervates the enteric nervous system. It's part of the enteric nervous system. So you have sensory neurons, which are the ones that tell you when your stomach gets upset or you're, you've got cramping or there's pain or something. So you get to feel all that wonderful stuff because you have the sensory neurons, motor and interneurons. So you've got them all. Okay. Um, nervous system is responsible for peristalsis, so it's smooth muscle, remember, so it's going to need the nervous system that helps control that. And also local reflexes, um, maybe cramping would be an example of a local reflex, if you think about it. Um, so then general stuff. Pretty much everything in the, ner in the digestive system, when we're talking about the nervous system, is regulated by your central nervous system. Um, <clears throat> mostly, the parasympathetic division is in responsible, because we call that the, the rest and digest division of the nervous system. So it makes sense that that's the, primarily the, the division that's controlling the functions of the digestive system. Sympathetic... Um, input can, on the other hand, cause undesirable results. So if let's say you ate a big meal and for some reason the sympathetic nervous system has been triggered, like you, um, unbeknownst to you, you ate a really big lunch and the school decided there's going to be like a mini marathon right after lunch and everybody had to do it. Okay, just go with me on this, all right? So you have a full stomach and now you're supposed to go run. So what would happen is the sympathetic system would kick in <laughs> and decrease the flow of blood to the digestive tract because right now, if the sympathetic division is kicked in, 
survival is more important than having blood to the digestive system to break down the food you're eating. So the blood is shunted to the muscles, to the areas that need it most for survival function. So what happens to the food in your tummy? Oh, that was a scientific word. In your stomach. It won't digest if you are... If you've trickled, triggered the sympathetic nervous system and you're on a full tummy and you're running or doing something very physically active, anybody, your stomach will get upset, you most likely will vomit, your body basically rejects the food because survival at that moment is more important than digesting the food you just ate. So usually, yeah, you don't want to do a lot of exercise on a full stomach or because it confuses the body of where is the blood supposed to be going right now. So if you, you know, people eat like a power bar or whatever, that's, that's fine. Don't eat a giant meal because then you might end up throwing up. Okay. Over to chemical regulation, there are, these are two of the hormones you were going to be learning about. And there's multiple hormones. Thank you, sir. And there's kind of like a, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'll stop. Um, and then there are also other chemicals that are involved, like histamine. And we talked about histamine in the respiratory system. And when we talked about histamine with the respiratory system, it was, you know, due to allergies. You know, we're getting the allergic response. We learned about the cells that release histamine in the blood um, as a response to allergens, etc. Um, but in this case, when we're talking about the digestive system, the histamine is going to be doing something different. Okay, So we've got three chemicals already mentioned, so you'll need to pay attention and follow those. And so for histamine, note it says it's helping local reflexes. In the, so ENS is the enteric nervous system. That's what it means. So it helps those local reflexes there control what's going on, going on inside the digestive system. So helping to control things like pH levels. You want to have a very, very low pH in your stomach, but once it's pushed, once it's gone into your small intestine, you don't want it to be a high, I mean, a really low acidic pH anymore. It is going to work to neutralize that because, yeah, we'll get there. So having the right pH level in the right portion of the digestive tract is important. Okay, peritoneum. And so this is just a quick slide talking about that membrane. So remember we had a set of three membranes we've learned about this year. The pleural membrane, digest, I mean, pleural membrane is for the respiratory system. Respiratory system. That will pop up on a quiz probably on Wednesday. Um, we also talked to per pericardium. So this is our third one, the peritoneum. So this is the abdominal pelvic cavity, okay? So just remembering again that visceral is the one that's in direct contact with the organs, and parietal is the second layer. And this, this layer also kind of cements itself against the wall of the abdomen. Um, and you will see, you'll be able to see that when we open up the mink Next week? Is it next week? Let me double check. Yes, we quite possibly are opening up the mink next week, so we'll make sure to point out the peritoneum, okay? And so retroperitoneal, we have talked about this before too. This is an organ or a structure that is actually behind the parietal peritoneum. And I believe we've talked about a few of these before. I may have forgot, maybe I, we didn't. But ones that are going to be super obvious for you once you do get into the abdominal pelvic cavity of the mink is that you will see the kidneys are very obviously behind the peritoneum, and so are the adrenal glands. Those are the easiest ones to see behind the peritoneum. The others are a little harder to tell once you've opened up the cavity, but these ones, for sure, you should know without a doubt if I ask you these ones for sure. But also note, pancreas is also retroperitoneal, which I'm going to be honest, I find it interesting because the pancreas is kind of underneath the stomach, and the stomach is not retroperitoneal. Anyways. 
Okay, the duodenum is the very first part of the small intestine, ascending and descending colon. So remember my lovely picture from Friday? Here's our ascending colon. Here's our descending colon. But our transverse is not retroperitoneal. Interesting. <clears throat> At rectum. The rectum, I know you guys were getting excited about that last week. The rectum is also retroperitoneal and the bladder. Those ones, as I said, those are harder to tell when you're inside a body. The easiest ones to tell are the first two, so I will definitely expect you to know those first two for sure, okay? Um, mesenteries. Now, there's, these, there's a set of membranes within the abdominal pelvic cavity, which are kind of interesting. Um, and so there's two, and they're a part of the peritoneum, but basically what it is is you have this connective tissue layer, and then it, it's sandwiched, and in the middle you have layers of fat. And depending on how uh, well-fed an animal was or how well-fed a person is, depends on how thick that fatty membrane is going to be. And so... So it says loose connective tissue in between. So remember, what type of tissue is not technically a connective tissue, but is always lumped into connective tissue because it's always found with loose connective tissue? I was just talking about it. Adipose tissue, remember that? It's kind of a weird tissue. So loose connective in between, including adipose. And you will see that, okay, when we open them up. So this layer of connective tissue with a sheet of little, with a sheet of loose connective tissue and adipose in the middle. And the greater omentum is the most obvious one. And this is attaches to the bottom curvature of the stomach. And we'll come up with a picture of the stomach very shortly. And so the greater omentum, as it implies, is bigger. This is the most obvious one, you will see. And this uh, connective tissue membrane is quite large, and what it does, so your stomach is like right about there, and so it's attached to the bottom of your stomach, and it wraps all the way down and around, covers all of your internal organs. So it's like this little sheet or blanket over all of your internal organs, like your intestines especially, and so it kind of, it's like a little blanket over them. So when you open up an animal, you basically kind of lift it up and pull it back so you can see what's underneath. And there's several purposes for that. Um, one of them is it helps insulate, helps keep the body temperature where it needs to be, helps with protection a bit of those internal organs as well. So there's a couple things right there. Okay, um, lesser omentum harder to see because it's tiny and it's attached to the top little curve of the stomach, the lesser curvature, um, and it doesn't really cover very much. It's, yeah, it doesn't do too much, but that's where you would find it. Okay, where is the stomach picture? I should have put a stomach, all right, well, we'll, we'll get to the stomach picture. I guess we're starting at the mouth, which makes sense. Remember, the mouth is the beginning, all the way to the rectum at the end. It's an open system, the alimentary canal, just remembering that. Okay, so structures that we need to remember, part of the digestive system in the mouth. Okay, so first of all, having your leap, leaps, lips and cheeks are important in your ability to talk and in your ability to chew. So... Besides looking a little funny, if we didn't have cheeks, what would happen? How would we chew our food or swallow our coffee or water or whatever? We would have problems, right? Yeah, I mean, it seems like a no-brainer that if, you know, God fortunately thought of all this stuff. Okay, lips do help with speech. Okay. Um, so the muscles that are responsible for the lips movements, orbicularis oris muscle, okay? And the, 
your lips is covered with simple squamous epithelial cells. It's a thinner layer, thus that's why you can see the color of the blood essentially underneath. And that's why, let's say, you jump, like for me, when I was little, I get into a cold pool or I'm cold and my parents immediately know I'm cold because my lips are purple. Why would my lips be purple? Yeah, blood is rushing away from the periphery and so it's going to change the color of your lips. That's why it's such an easy, quick indicator of cyanosis or if someone's cold, okay? Um, so, okay, cheeks. Cheeks, we have an important muscle involved with our chewing, um, and we call that the buccinator. And I'm sorry, but it always makes me think of the governator. Um, and there's also a fat pad. It's called the buccal fat. Okay, you're not going to get it unless you're from California. Okay, there's a buccal fat pad in your cheek, and it just, it's there. And that's one of the things people remove in plastic surgery. This little tiny fat pad to make them look a little more hollow cheeked. It just doesn't seem worth it, but that is something people remove. I should probably not watch those shows anymore. I stopped watching those shows. They had like the. It's interesting to watch surgeries. I'm just a weird person. So I've seen, I watch surgeries, and I watch a surgery where they remove the buccal fat pads from a person's cheek, and I honestly could not tell the difference before or after. It's like, wow, how much money did you spend on that? Okay, all right, moving on to the palate. You have a hard palate and a soft palate. The hard palate, if you remember from learning the bones of the skull, is made up of the palatine process of the maxilla, and then those two little palatine bones. It's hard because it's made of bone, okay? And then you have the soft palate, which is posterior to that, and that's made up of muscle and connective tissue, so it's literally soft compared to the bone of the hard palate. Okay, let's see. Muscle connective tissue. Uvula. Okay, you guys know what your uvula is, right? Yes. Oh, I have a story for you in just a second, a very short one. Um, so... That will be in the picture in the next slide. And then palatine tonsils, so the side walls, so lateral walls, so on the sides, back of the sides. Okay, so I'll point those out. So lovely picture of the mouth. So first of all, our hard palate pretty much extends probably to about here. And then you have your palatine process of your maxilla, and then you have your palatine bones and all your palatine foramina. Oh, the remembering the skull. Okay, then you have your soft palate. This lovely guy right here, this dude hanging down, that's your uvula. Anybody know what the function of the uvula is? It, okay. Well, it kind of has something to do with your airway. So, have you guys ever eaten any some e any, eaten something or took a drink and then someone made you laugh and it came out your nose? <laughs> yeah, you all know what I'm talking about. So, the uvula is there to kind of help prevent stuff from doing that. It's obviously not perfect. Once my cousin made me laugh so hard while I was eating potato salad that it came out my nose. And it, it hurt. Much worse than having Dr. Pepper come out your nose. So, but also, did you know that people pierce their uvulas? When I was trying to find pictures of uvulas, it came up with just a bunch of pictures of pierced uvulas. With a ring or a little post through it. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they don't gag. Maybe they are, but... Yes, just the more you know. So, but you should know the proper function of the uvula is to help protect the upper the nasal cavity from things going up where they shouldn't go. Just kind of like the epiglottis protects your respiratory system down below from anything going down into it, okay? Um, and then these little stars are representing kind of in the sides and the back of where you would find those tonsils. Okay, the tongue. Um, this is a skeletal muscle, which is mus very muscular structure. 
Um, it's attached in the posterior down kind of below. Um, and there's two muscle types, and they have different functions for the tongue. So you have intrinsic muscles that allow the tongue to change shape. So, for example, any of you guys do spit, spit wads when you're in elementary school? You know, you roll your tongue up and just spit it out. Nobody ever did that? Maybe that was an 80s thing. How many of you can roll your tongue? Do you know, that's genetic, by the way. So, your intrinsic muscles allow your tongue to change shape. So... Rolling your tongue or doing weird shapes with your tongue, you're using your intrinsic muscles. However, you also have extrinsic muscles, and those allow you to stick your tongue out at someone, to stick your tongue out, bring it back in, or waggle it side to side. Okay, but if you change the shape of the tongue, those are your intrinsic muscles. Then there is also a structure um, attached on either side. Um, it's the lingual, well oh, actually no, this one is at the base of your tongue. This is the lingual frenulum, and it's this little piece of connective tissue that attaches your tongue down to the bottom of your mouth. And um, I'll show you in the next picture again. In the front portion of your tongue, or the anterior portion, you have papillae. And we briefly talked about papillae when we, in lab, when we talked about taste and all that. Fun lab, remember that? That fun lab where you got to taste things? Um, some of the papillae have taste buds, some do not. I'm not going to ask you to remember all that stuff from before, unless it's on the final, which is coming up. Start coming in, studying your old quizzes and exams. It will help you. Just a heads up, sorry, I mentioned a bad, bad topic. Um, the back portion, the posterior portion of the tongue, there's very few taste buds, okay? And the ones towards the back, oh, I want to, I think I've, I want to say back, you have more concentration of bitter taste buds. I could be wrong, it's been a little while since we've talked about them. Then you also have your lingual tonsils, which are on the back on the sides, Okay. And so what does your tongue do? What are the major functions? Move food in the mouth. Yes, it helps you to speech and is very important in swallowing. So three very important functions of the tongue. Okay? So looking again, first I want to point out a few things. So the lingual frenulum is what I was just talking about. It's this little connective tissue part here that attaches to the base of your tongue, down to the base of your mouth. That little lingual frenulum, depending, it can be very tight, so it can hold your tongue close to the base of your mouth, or it can be loose. It kinda, it's a little bit genetic. So, I pro I'm going to tell you the story anyways because it's very relevant. Sorry. Um, my son, another son story, this one he won't care about, he won't care about this one, he already knows. Um, he was born with a very tight frenulum, so tight that he was not able to breastfeed or feed from a bottle properly, because a baby has to be able to stick their tongue out to breastfeed, and he couldn't. He couldn't even get it out of his mouth. Um, so when babies have really tight frenulums, Doctors will tell you one of two things. Oh, it will stretch out. Okay, so how does the baby feed? Or you go get it trimmed or you go get it snipped. So I decided to go and get it snipped. They just snipped like like probably two or three millimeters, probably two millimeters of it. And it didn't hurt. I mean, for a second it hurt. And it was over, and then that kid could breastfeed, and he, could, he was a happy little boy after that. But when it's really tight, it can affect breastfeeding. It, my father has a very tight frenulum, never changed. That, of course, he was born in 1950. Oh, my goodness. That was a big period where everybody bottle-fed their babies. His is still really tight. He can't stick his tongue out of his mouth. Just, I just never really re thought about it or realized it until my son had the problem. 
I fi- at least I'm, I'm glad I fixed Ben's tight frenulum, but my dad can't really stick his tongue out of his mouth. It's like that. That's it. So, and if it's really tight, it also can affect your speech, because remember, your tongue is important in speech. If it's very tight, it makes it hard to talk properly, so a lot of people will have to go to speech therapy to learn how to talk properly. It just seems easier just to snip the frenulum a little bit. Um, What else did we talk about? There also is a frenulum of the upper lip. Most of you at some point in your life probably ripped and tore that sucker. Um, It happens. If you fall down, smack your face, it will rip it. My son did that too. He fell down, smacked his face on the tile, and ripped his frenulum, which is, you know, okay. And then jammed his tooth up into his mouth too. He, He keeps my life interesting. There's my baby boy. Just wanted to show you. Okay, so last little thing of teeth. Um, baby teeth and adult teeth. So two, so two sets. And so he's showing you he has some of that two set when he was, he was like a year and a half old. Um, so people can call them many different terms, milk teeth, baby teeth. I always just call them baby teeth, but notice all the different terms we have for those. Our primary teeth would be also appropriate. Those are the teeth that you first grow in, but you don't keep them. Deciduous kind of reminds me of trees that lose their leaves in the, in the fall, which makes sense because you're going to lose all of your primary teeth. Okay? And then as you enter, well, as you start losing those teeth, you're growing in adult teeth, your permanent or secondary teeth. Notice that babies have much fewer teeth in their mouth compared to us as adults. We have 32 total. I think that's counting the the wisdom teeth, but most people do get those removed. <clears throat> so basic types of teeth, you have your incisors, which are the ones right in the front. Okay, your canines, the pointy ones that you know everyone likes to say. You people actually alter their teeth to make them look like they're a fangs. They do. It's the whole like vampire thing. Premolars, so the first little molars behind your canines, and then the full-on molars in the back. Okay, so I am going to skip this slide. Okay. Let's get to some of the more interesting stuff. Okay, mastication, the process of chewing. So, chewing, well, first of all, you need your incisors, the front teeth, for biting off a chunk of food. Then you are going to be chewing it with your molars and your premolars, and you're basically trying to grind it up into small pieces. So this is part of that chemical, I mean, sorry, this is part of that mechanical digestion you're breaking it down mechanically with your teeth. And so muscles that are involved with the chewing process, you have the masseter, the temporalis, so the, the muscles up here, believe it or not, and then the medial and lateral pterygoids. Does that the pterygoid, does that word sound familiar to you? Mm. Bones. Bones. Yes, we had a medial and lateral pterygoid process. Remember that? That, that was the skull again. It was but so we have pterygoid muscles attached to the medial pterygoid process and the lateral pterygoid process. Okay, so different muscles do different functions. So to elevate the mandible or to elevate your chin, okay, you have to use your temporalis, masseter, and medial pterygoid. Um, do depress, so drop, open your mouth, pull it open actually, You're using your lateral pterygoids. So protraction, what's, remember what protraction means? Yeah, so if I protracted my neck, I'd be kind of almost like jutting my chin out. So protraction, oh, lateral and medial excursion, I don't, I'm not going to ask you that. Retraction, bringing it back, temporalis. Um, we don't have any bald students. When I had a, I had a student who shaved his head, He was eating in class one day, and it was while we were talking about this, we could actually see his temporalis muscles flexing when he was chewing. It was really cool, and he didn't mind that we were all looking at him. (laughs) But it was neat to see it actually, the muscles kind of working as he was chewing. It was kind of, it was cool. Okay, salivary glands. 
three pairs of salivary glands. You do need to know the three, um, where you find them. Um, they do, all three produce different types or concentrations of fluids, okay? So first of all, the parotid gland is the largest one. This is our parotid gland. Look at this sucker, super big, okay? It's the largest of all of them, and it produces a serous fluid, okay? The parotid duct is this, oh, I need to change my color, but I don't know what's going to be good. We'll just do it in yellow. The parotid duct right here, this green tube, enters right into the mouth. And so that's one of the things I told you to be careful for when you're trying to clean the mink on one side to see its masseter, because the parotid gland kind of covers the masseter and also the facial nerve. Um, so parotid duct. Then we have, so this is number one, is parotid. Number two, submandular gland. And this says mix, so we're talking about the fluid that's secreted. So mix with serous and mucus, so more serous than mucus. And the submandular gland is this guy right here, okay? And then note here is the duct, the submandular duct in green, and that empties out at the base of your mouth, okay? Um, just for a second, I want to back up quickly really quickly come on where's the picture so your sub so right here opening of the submandular ducts those two little holes right there you guys know what a gleeking is right where you squirt out sal saliva well it's coming out of the submandular duct at the base of your frenulum frenulum the bottom of your mouth so you're squeezing out uh, saliva from your submandular duct Okay, um, and so notice it enters it on either side of the lingual frenulum, like I showed you in the picture just now. Then the third salivary gland is the sublingual. Sublingual, so sub meaning below, lingual referring to tongue. So it's going to be below the tongue. And so it's the smallest one as well. And so the sublingual is this little dude right here. And I know it's hard to see in this picture, but there's all these little tiny, tiny t ducks, a bunch of little tiny ones that open up at the base, the bottom of the mouth. So there's not like a one large duct, there's a bunch of little tiny ones. So each has, it says 10 to 12 the ducks to enter the bottom floor. Um, lingual glands. Not going to worry about this one, making life easier, er, because you can't even see it in the picture. Okay. Saliva. So, if you remember from the previous slide, we have one that's all serous fluid, one that's serous and mucus, and then one that's just mucus. So, they're all, they're, they have mixed types of fluid in your saliva. And it's produced in what we call these compound alveolar salivary glands. So this is the example of what the gland would look like. Okay, so this would be the duct. You have mucus alveoli where mucus being produced. Again, what kind of cell makes mucus? Goblet. Goblet. Thank you all. And then you have other alveoli where you're producing things like serous fluid, where it says serous alveoli, where it says mixed, you're making both mucus and serous fluid. Then that, the contents empty into the duct and then out to your mouth. Okay, so what does saliva do for us? Well, prevents bacterial infection, lubrication. So a good example would be... If you've ever eaten like a bunch of saltine crackers and then tried to talk or whistle, it dries your mouth out and, and because you don't have any lubrication, it makes it impossible to make any to whistle. I think whistling was the thing, or even to talk. You're just so dry. So the saliva has an important purpose. And we also know from lab that 
if saliva is not present to help dissolve the food you're eating, you can't taste it. Remember that? Um, in addition, saliva has an enzyme. And it's my favorite enzyme for very superficial reasons. That's my name in it. And so um, amylase is an enzyme that's present in your saliva. So, and particularly you need to know that it helps with breaking down starches. So, what are some examples of starchy food? Potatoes, potato chips, french fries, yeah, stuff with carbohydrates. It's kind of a special type of carbohydrate. So, in that case, amylase actually begins chemical digestion in your mouth. But that's the only chemical that's being used at the moment in your mouth. So in a sense, it can begin, it does begin in your mouth with amylase, with the whole process of mechanical breaking the food into smaller pieces with your teeth. Also, the fluid helps you to form that bolus, that ball of food that you form with your tongue before you swallow it. And then what triggers the saliva to start flowing? Well, it's the parasympathetic division of the nervous system the rest or digest division. And you can even start salivating before you even eat the food in anticipation to the food. I'm sure that has happened to you. Or you've heard of Pavlov's dog's experiments. Um, yeah, so I, so sympathetic, parasympathetic division can get you, your juices flowing, your saliva going before you even eat. Okay. Swallowing, there are three phases to swallowing, okay? First of all, the voluntary phase is where you have formed that bolus or that ball of food, and you use your tongue and move it to the back of your throat, okay? Back of the pharynx. And then the pharyngeal phase, this is a reflex. This is not a voluntary thing. So once the bolus gets to the pharynx, it triggers the swallowing reflex. That swallowing reflex is controlled by the medulla oblongata, part of our brainstem. Okay, so that's just a reflex. Once the ball, the bolus hits that, then the reflex to swallow occurs. And then the third phase is the esophageal reflex. So once it's in the esophagus, that stretching, because it's going to use your, your esophagus is flat with nothing in it, okay? So when you swallow something, it's going to stretch it out, and that stretching of the esophagus is going to trigger the nervous system to trigger peristalsis to squeeze it down into your stomach, okay? Peristalsis. Okay, so here we go. We finally have a picture of the stomach. So before I start talking about the other stuff that's written there, I just want to increase the size of this picture for a second and show you where you would find those omentums, the greater and lesser omentum. So here we have the greater curvature, and so you would find the greater omentum attached along this curve of the stomach, okay? And it's like a sheet, so it's huge, okay? It's called the greater omentum, so that makes sense. Here's our lesser curvature, much smaller. So the lesser omentum attaches along that lesser curvature. Notice that it's much, it's gonna be much smaller. There's less area for it to attach to. And usually this membrane stays pretty small, okay? It stays pretty small, so be, this is your lesser, example of your lesser omentum. An example of your greater omentum. All right, now I'll zoom out. Oh, wait. Is it all the way? Okay. <clears throat> so anatomy of the stomach. Oh, I think there we go. I'm still learning a little bit about this program. There. Oh, come on. Okay. So two, two openings, essentially, to the stomach. Remember, again, the whole digestive system is an open system. So you have your... Um, <clears throat> your gastroesophageal opening, so it's coming from your esophagus. Sometimes it's also called the cardiac opening because it is literally like right behind your heart. Okay, 
where the opening is like passing right behind your heart. Like right down there would be where the opening is. So sometimes like if you have acid reflux, it literally feels like the burning is where your heart is. So heartburn. Okay, so we have two names for that, the gastroesophageal or cardiac opening. And then we have the pyloric opening, which is right here, which is where sh food that has been churned and mixed and chemically digested into even smaller bits finally exit and then enter your duodenum, the first part of your small intestine. So, <clears throat> but first looking more at the anatomy of the stomach, we have the cardiac portion of the stomach. And so the cardiac part is right up here, the top portion where we have the connection from the esophagus to the stomach. And again, it's called the cardiac portion because it's right in the vicinity of the heart itself. Then we have the fundus, which is the top rounded part of the stomach. And the, that's just kind of what they call... Top, top rounded portions of organs. Another organ that has a fundus is the uterus. And it's the same kind of round top portion. Then you have the, the body of the stomach, and then last, the pyloric portion, which is right before this pyloric sphincter, which controls the movement of chyme, the digested chemical food, from the stomach into the duodenum. Um, already talked about the greater and lesser curvatures. I'm going to talk briefly about the sphincters. You have two sphincters in the stomach, or controlling what's coming and going from your stomach. So you have the cardiac sphincter, which is between your esophagus. Ooh, esophagus and stomach. And then you also have your pyloric sphincter, which is between your the stomach and the duodenum, the first part of your small intestines. I might be spelling it wrong. Okay, so you know your two sphincters, cardiac, pyloric, and where would we find them, okay? Um, stomach histology, so if we look closer at the wall of the stomach, then we start to see different types of cells, uh, cells that produce different types of secretions that aid in digestion. Um, we get to see the different layers of muscle and how they're going to function in breaking down food. So if we're going from layers from superficial to deep, okay, <clears throat> so the most superficial layer would be the, the visceral peritoneum. So that would be this layer here, just a thin connective tissue layer. Then as you move deeper, you have three layers of smooth muscle, three layers. Notice they all run in different directions. So the outermost layer is longitudinal. So I'll try to draw, oh, let me try harder. Try to draw longitudinal lines. The middle layer is circular. Oh, that's kind of hard to represent. The middle layer is circular, okay? <laughs> and then the inner is oblique. And oblique means what? It's angle, okay? So this is awful little drawing, but the idea is you have muscle fibers running in all possible directions to help the stomach with the churning and mixing and moving that it needs to do in its job of chemical digestion. Then even deeper we have what's called the submucosa. And the submucosa is this layer here that's kind of white. Okay, and you have, you have blood vessels there. You also have blood vessels in this, the visceral per, peritoneum. And then your deepest layer is the mucosa. And I have three minutes, so I don't know what you're getting antsy about. So the deepest layer, your mucosa layer, is... Why is there so much talking? It's a bit. Thank you. Um, so with the mucosa layer, notice it's the thickest layer. And there's a lot of folding in the stomach as well. Okay, so this thick mucosa layer is going to be, Greg, is going to be producing mucus. Okay, thank you. And 
there will also be other substances that are produced as well. First of all, we talked about mucus on Monday and why it's so important in the stomach. Helps protect the stomach itself. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, Ronnie, Sue. Do you prefer one or both? Okay. Um, so these folds in the stomach, we call them rugae. Okay? And within those folds, we have cells that produce all sorts of great uh, digestive substances. And <clears throat> these are in the gastric pits. So a gastric pit right up here started. We got a little pit down in the stomach wall. And then you'll have to look at this, see if I can enlarge this. Look at this picture closely. The different colors of these cells represent what they're secreting. Okay? So all the top ones, notice, are yellow. And those are all secreting mucus, which we know is incredibly important to protect the stomach wall. I got two minutes still. Okay, so cells we would find in the gastric pits. We have the surface cells that are producing the mucus that protects the stomach. Protects the stomach from the digestive enzymes and acid from digesting the stomach itself. The mucus neck cells, the ones in this region here, well, they make mucus. Then we get down to the interesting ones, and I'm going to finish this right one minute. He's, you have parietal cells that make your hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. You have your chief cells that make pepsinogen. We'll talk more about all of these next time. Then you also note, this is interesting, you have endocrine cells in your stomach. Okay? Endocrine cells that are involved with regulatory functions. So look at these because I know you guys are just waiting to get out of this classroom. So please look at these and we will start on slide 21 on Friday. Alrighty? Remember your quiz? No, we'll start it after your quiz on Wednesday because you're just taking a quiz, not an exam. We'll start this after your quiz on Wednesday. Thank you very, very much. Have a good day. Yes.